Good morning, everyone. My name is S. Lisa Herndon, and I'm a member of the Charlottesville Area Association of Realtors Board of Directors. I also serve as a member on the CARS Virginia Realtors and National Association of Realtors Diversity and Inclusion Committee. CAR is committed to modeling diversity and inclusion for the entire community and to maintaining an inclusive environment with equitable treatment for all. In an effort to challenge ourselves to be better, CAR is committed to bringing influential speakers to broaden our mindset and change the way we think or approach issues and situations. I would like to officially welcome you to America's Persistent Color Line and Housing, Charlottesville as an important case study with Dr. James Robert Saunders. Your presence this morning demonstrates that you want to be an active participant in addressing racial injustice in our communities and around the nation. I would like to acknowledge and thank our collaboration partner, the National Association of Realist Brokers, Realist Chapter of Richmond. I'm excited to share this event, which is one of three events we will be collaborating on this year. With their partnership, we were able to acquire a National Association of Realtors $5,000 diversity grant for this event. I also like to thank our pre presenting sponsor, Virginia Housing. Their sponsorship allowed us to provide complimentary copies of Urban Renewal and the End of Black Culture in Charlottesville, Virginia, books to members of both CAR and NARAB, Realist Chapter of Richmond. At this time, I would like to welcome Frank <clears throat> Webster of Virginia Housing to share a few words. Frank? Thank you, Lisa. We are proud to be the presenting sponsor for this event. I just wanted to share a little bit with you about Virginia Housing and our commitment to the ideals that we're going to be discussing today. Virginia Housing is one of the nation's premier housing finance organizations. Our mission is to help all Virginians attain quality, affordable housing, which we accomplish through our private-public partnerships. We are committed to inclusion, diversity, equity, and access among our associates, customers, and affordable housing partners. Ultimately, Virginia Housing seeks to foster more inclusive and sustainable communities as one fundamental element of the greater affordable housing purpose. In practical terms, some of the ways that we uh, help first-time home buyers uh, to achieve their dreams of owning a home and making sure that uh, inclusively and with diversity that this happens is that we provide all forms of assistance in the lending process. We provide down payment assistance. We provide closing cost assistance, tax credits, lower cost mortgage insurance, lower interest rates, and free home buyer education. And the combination of these things uh, allows many individuals to to achieve home ownership for the first time that they might have been shut out of without us, or they would have been delayed in their transaction. While getting all of these benefits, the buyers still get to use their local lenders, they get to use the familiar loan programs, and they get it all through one-stop shopping, so they don't have to go out and apply for multiple grants or multiple benefits from different sources, they can get it all through that one source. So I am available as a representative of Virginia Housing to conduct training uh, or to sponsor lunch and learns in individuals' offices or uh, in their or for their organizations. So if anyone would like to learn more about how Virginia Housing can help uh, accomplish these goals, uh, please uh, be in contact with me and I look forward to working with all of you. And again, thank you for letting us have the opportunity to sponsor this event. Frank, thank you again for your support. If you want to learn more about how Virginia Housing can help you and your clients, please download today's handout. A link to the handout will be um, posted in the Zoom chat at various times throughout this morning's session. Before I pass the session to 
Katrina Tyree, president of NARAB, Realist Chapter of Richmond. We're going to share a few minutes to view a video on the history of NARAB. Going back to 1947, uh, NARAB was founded because African Americans could not be members of NAR, you know, at that time. And so there were a number of local real estate, African American real estate trade associations around the country who decided to come together and form a national organization. We would be accused of blockbustering. You see, in introducing, I know we had a case in Atlanta <coughs> where we were charged with introducing uh, some disruptive kind of residents in white areas when we would sell a black person a house in a white neighborhood. When they opened it up, the women could go in and sell. Most of the men could not. They did have a problem with black men. I think they were still kind of frightened. To join together black real estate professionals and to fight for the rights of African-American homeowners, 12 people founded the National Association of Real Estate Brokers in Tampa, Florida, July 1947. The NAREB developed out of the National Negro Business League, whose founder was educator Booker T. Washington. W.D. Morrison of Detroit was NAREB's first president. The group called itself NAREB and its members Realtists and established its motto in the 1950s, democracy in housing. It was created because the realtors were calling themselves realtors. No, we couldn't call ourselves. See, the realtors is a trademark. It's patented. We thought realtors was the most appropriate term. There is nothing better than coming with your brothers and your sisters and sharing in education, sharing ideas, and knowing that you are considered the cream of the crop of minority real estate professionals. NARAB president from 2007 to 2009, Maria Kong, joins a long line of past presidents who have built on the accomplishments of great leaders before them. Presidents like George Harris, 1953, the only president to serve three terms. Q. V. Williamson, 1963, who established NAREP's headquarters in Washington, D.C., a first for any trade association. Albert Johnson, 1987, who with Presidents Williamson and William Hamilton founded NAREP affiliate RIMBY, the Real Estate Management Brokers Institute. President Tom Holmes, 1985, opened brand new doors for NAREP in the nation's capital. And Evelyn Reeves in 1989 became NARAB's first woman president. It's really a, a family, and it's a family of opportunity. It's a family of education. It will open your eyes to anything you want to do. NARAB really let me do. I could do and be the best of whatever I wanted to do. That's, that's really what it was. Because you are the key. Not only are you out there interacting and uh, making the uh, home ownership uh, possibilities happen, and I know what your goals are. Gaining access to power, NAREB led the fight for fair housing in America and would change the race game forever for black homeowners and real estate professionals. NAREB, more than any other group, pushed for the Fair Housing Act of 1968. The groundbreaking legislation did away with legal barriers to blacks moving into white neighborhoods and the law made it illegal to discriminate against black real estate professionals. NARAB's Atlanta board, the Empire Board of Realtors, won a landmark lawsuit filed in the 1980s that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The ruling made it illegal for the Multiple Listing Service, or MLS, to require agents be a member of the National Association of Realtors, or NAR, to use the MLS advertising service. Realtors and any other qualified agent were now able to join. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for sharing that video. As you can see from the video, um, 
the National Association of Real Estate Brokers started in 1947. Realtors Chapter of Richmond is just one of 75 chapters that we currently have in the United States and in Ghana. On behalf of our chapter, the Realtors Chapter of Richmond, I just want to thank Carr and Lisa and Allie for inviting us to, uh, to participate in this wonderful event. We have, um, we're very excited about this event and the ones to come in the future. As you can see from the video, we, it started in 1947, but we still have a long way to go. Our chapter strives for, to, excuse me, to achieve our goal of democracy in housing. We partner with several of our national partners, such as um, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase, um, excuse me, just to name a few, um, Freddie and Fannie, and reaching those goals of dem democracy and housing. Not only do we have um, events such as first time homebuyer events, we also, NARAB is very instrumental in also educating um, our members, which as they said, are called realtors, so we can achieve our goals. One little fact is the uh, tidbit is the chapter is called the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, but you do not have to be a broker to join our chapter. A lot of people are deceived by that, but anybody in the real estate field can be a member of our chapter. We have um, real estate agents, um, appraisals, just anything. We have lawyers. So please feel free to reach out to us. Again, we're excited to be here today and happy to participate in this event and look forward to, a, excuse me, to attending and participating in the ones in the fall. Right now, I would like to turn it over to our chaplain, Pamela Westbrook, to say our morning prayer. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do bless you and thank you for another day that you have allowed us to wake up to new mercies and to a fresh anointing. We thank you for bringing us together for this meeting so that we can address the concerns in our communities. We thank you now, Father, for our leaders, our speakers our members and our attendees. We thank you for this day and we give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Patrina and Chaplain Westbrook. We appreciate that. And I am a new member of NAREB as well, so thank you. Carr and NARAB Realist Chapter of Richmond have decided to raise money during this session for both Habitat for Humanities of Greater Charlottesville and Richmond Metropolitan Habitat for Humanities. As many of you know, Habitat for Humanity brings people together to build and rebuild homes and communities while catalyzing new pathways to safe, decent, and affordable housing. A donation link at the end of of each nonprofit will share will be shared via the Zoom chat throughout this morning's session. When donating, please include car in the notes section or in the honor of field so that we can keep track. This information will help us track the donations during um, donate donations during this session, this particular session. We thank you in advance for your consideration to supporting the habitat of Greater Charlottesville and the Richmond Metropolitan Habitat for humanity. We will now move on to today's event, America's Persistent Color Line in Housing, Charlottesville as an Important Case Study by Dr. Saunders. Please know that we will hold a Q&A with Dr. Saunders after this presentation. So if you have any questions, hold tight. You may submit any questions at any time during the Zoom chat or Q&A feature in the Q&A future. Dr. Saunders is a professor of English at Purdue University and specializes in African-American literature, contemporary African-American authors, and American pop culture. He is one of the authors of Urban Renewal and the End of Black Culture in Charlottesville, Virginia, and All History of Vinegar Hill. Dr. Sanders, thank you for being with us today, this morning. I will turn the session over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can everyone hear me? Thank you. I'm assuming that that's the case. 
Uh, good morning to everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking the Realtist chapter of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, the Charlottesville Area Association of Realtors, and the National Association of Realtors, that last organization having substantially financed this program. Though she requested that I not mention her, I would be remiss if I did, if I did not mention that it was Ms. Alexandra DeGuardo who first reached out to me and then later provided me with information, both with regard to your organizations and the issue of housing in Charlottesville. I am also grateful for other participants in this program. Ms. Leslie Frazier, Ms. S. Lisa Herndon, Ms. Petrina Tyree, and Mr. Frank Webster, the sponsor of the program, as I'm beginning more and more to understand, and also for that organization's financial contributions. Moreover, I want to express my appreciation to you realtors who have made the program a reality as much as anyone else. And I thank the people behind the scenes, the secretaries, the clerks, the family members who have made certain kinds of sacrifices so that we can all participate. In the packet that I provided in the, is the essay, Excluding Blacks and Others from Housing, the Foundation of White Racism. One of the reasons that I included it is because of Fagan's startling assertion that the problem that exists for Blacks in terms of housing in America stems from the era of slavery. It is a startling assertion. Reagan goes on to say that many more Blacks than whites feel that racism is still today a profound part of Black people's lives well over a century and a half after slavery had formally ended. Those who may have thought that racism was not systematic had no choice but to strongly consider those assertions once we witnessed what happened to Mr. George Floyd and had to wonder how often it had occurred in the past before the advent of video cameras. What excuses, unquestioned, did policemen offer in explanation for a dead black body? One had only to look inside the store where Floyd spent his final minutes to know that something was wrong already. Must have been wrong for a very long time in Minneapolis. And if in Minneapolis, then how often had that same scene been played out all across the country? The segregation, I saw no white customers. The ownership, not black. The dilapidation that's seem to be creeping up out of the sidewalks. Now you may be asking, what does policing have to do with housing? I can best make the connection for you this way. Years ago, I had a desire to move my family out of the inner city of Toledo, Ohio. Too dangerous, bad education system. So I moved out to the suburb of Sylvania. It was just a little bungalow. My wife and I were renting, but we were safe in a neighborhood just as peaceful and quaint as one could find in Andy Griffith's Mayberry, the Springfield, the Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver, and the Donna Reed Show. I was a two-miler in high school. Never got jogging out of my system. Now in my 40s, I hadn't given up the habit, though I could jog, thought I could jog in my new white neighborhood where it was safe. In mid-jog, I heard the, bla the blaring of police sirens come up behind me. The officers pulled me to the side and accused me of burglarizing homes. It, it is a rather long story, but I won't bother with any more of the details, especially since you've heard the story a hundred times before. Strange as it might sound, I wanted to move deeper into the white enclave of Sylvania and found a wonderful house available as rent to own. The owner was very cordial, showed us some of the house. I had good credit. I was ready to start packing. Suddenly we could no longer get in touch with the owner. Then the house was pulled off the market, no longer available for either rental or purchase. It was a bizarre home search, but not so much different from what occurred in Richmond in 2002, when Miss Neely Pitts sought to purchase Mr. Rufus Matthews bungalow. He told her it's not for colored. When she per pursued legal remedy, he simply pulled the house off the market. Matthews was very much like Mr. Lindner in A Raisin in the Sun who, representing the Homeowners Association, told the prospective black buyer that a man has the right to want to have the neighborhood he lives in a certain way. Our Negro families are happier when they live in their own communities. Linda must not have had the opportunity to examine what it was like on the South side of Chicago. 
he was either ignorant of that environment or he simply didn't care. It's hard to tell because a pleasant face and kind sounding words can hide a whole lot. We must ask ourselves, how did it get to that point? And to what extent are we at the same point now? The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution enacted in 1865 abolished slavery, which suggests that Blacks were entitled to the rights of any other United States citizen. That same year, the 14th Amendment was enacted, supposedly to reinforce what the previous amendment had said, this time put into the words, all persons born or national naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and of the state in which they reside. It is what is often referred to as the Equal Protection Clause, making it one of the more important amendments. In essence, it says that we are all equal. It should have removed all doubt for anyone who might have thought that Blacks should still be regarded as three-fifths of an individual, chattel, or any other scheme that had been devised to argue that Blacks were not 100% human beings. The very next year, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was passed, declaring that all people born in the United States are legally citizens. That act was meant to assist former slaves in their efforts to rent, hold, buy, and sell property. In 1917, the United States Supreme Court ruled against ordinances that forbade, quote unquote, coloreds from moving into white neighborhoods. The National Housing Act of 1934 sought to make housing and mortgages more affordable. The Housing Act of 1937 established programs for affordable housing. That legislation laid the groundwork for the building of housing projects throughout the country, including Charlottesville. The Housing Act of 1954 expanded on the 1937 Act, providing funding for 140,000 units of public housing. By the time we reached the 1960s, with the Fair Housing Act of 1968, one of an, a series of civil rights legislation passed during that time, we are left to wonder whether over the past century and a half, we have been placed in the middle of a system that for a long time has been in confrontation with itself. Otherwise, why the need for so much legislation and court cases that say the same thing? Blacks are citizens entitled to the same rights and privileges as any other citizen. Of course, we know the answer to that question, and it does include racism. The notion that whites are somehow better than blacks. It takes us back to Fagan's essay and his assertion that the housing problem for blacks stems back to the housing mechanisms of slavery. The slave shacks on one side, the big house on the other. The writer Wallace Steigner once said, quote, the entire history of America is that of one continuum real estate transaction. I would add, to use Stagner's word transaction, that the history began with early America issuing legal documents, that is treaties, and then ignoring them in order to steal the indigenous people's land. Shall we say, yes, Mr. Stagner, you are right. It all began right there. Which brings us to Vinegar Hill, a thriving Black community in the heart of the city of Charlottesville. Granted, many of the structures were dilapidated, not unlike the dilapidated house that my mother and I lived in back when I was about three years old, not far from the housing project Fairfield Court on the Churchill side of Richmond. It was dilapidated, but a step up from where she grew up in the country with no electricity or running water. Similar structures existed on Vinegar Hill, where the city came daily to empty containers of human waste. And it wasn't unusual to see chickens running around, running around in some yards. But in addition, to those substandard homes were homes that were up to code and black churches and 29 black businesses, businesses that had developed and processed over the course of 80 odd years. Businesses that included tailors, restaurants, fish markets, beauty shops, barber shops, furniture stores, pool halls, grocery stores, a building contractor, a dentist, a physician, clothing stores, a shoe repair shop, just to name some. It was the hub of black activity, both business and residential. The area was adjacent to what is now Charlottesville, Charlottesville's downtown pedestrian mall, which has virtually no diversity, particularly in terms of black business ownership. The process whereby that decades long conversion took place had very little input put from the residents themselves. There were no black city council members at the time, 
No black businessmen with the power to significantly influence city affairs. As black renters were being shuffled from downtown to an indistinct housing project off to the side, away from downtown, much was lost in terms of culture, history, resources, and perhaps most importantly, pride. While not as violently dismantled as Tulsa's Black Wall Street, and nowhere near as large as that Black Wall Street with its 191 businesses, Charlottesville did have a Black Wall Street that out of a city ordained necessity was meticulously erased. If Benega Hill had been a white business district of such significance, would there have been no effort to preserve anything, however tenuous some of the living conditions were, however fluid some of the businesses might have been? Would those whites have been moved into a housing project behind a concrete wall? Would the whites who own businesses have been promised to get first dibs on their old property as the redevelopment plan progressed, only to learn that nothing could have been farther from the truth? That is why I included Ms. Booker's article in the packet. Where do the people go while the city builds housing? Seven years after Vinegar Hill had been raised, Charlottesville was intent on building another housing project. Quite understandably, the black residents of the city were suspicious. In terms of the prospect of buying a house, Ms. Jones, a black nurse claimed, there is discrimination from realtors who either won't sell or show houses to blacks or who raise house prices to blacks. Ms. Kaysen, a can Mr. Kaysen, a candidate for city council as well, well as being a realtor, objected, saying there are plenty of houses on large estates in the country which could be rented if landowners would agree to rent. It sounded to me like the old plantation days. Upon reading of Kaysen's suggestion, I couldn't help but recall the times I had taken the quote unquote local trailways bus ride to UVA instead of the quote unquote express and seen with my very own eyes, blacks in their janitorial orderly and waitress or waiter uniforms boarding that quote unquote local bus as it made its way through the count counties to drop off its black passengers at the university and its surroundings. I saw black men in their early twenties. Who looked twice as old as my 20 year old classmates at UVA. So for me, Kaysen's solution is lacking. Since we have come upon the issue of realtors in such a direct way, I must express my admiration for the realtor's code of ethics. For my purposes, I will draw our attention to Article 3, which reads in part, realtors may refuse, may not refuse, excuse me, to cooperate, cooperate on the basis of a broker's race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familiar status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Article 10 reads in part, realtors shall not deny equal professional services to any person for reasons of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Realtors shall not be parties to any plan or agreement to discriminate against the person or persons on the basis of race, color, et cetera. That very much sounds like the codification of the 1948 Supreme Court case, Shelley v. Kramer, which ruled that racially restrictive covenants could not be legally enforced. As I read on in your code of ethics, though, I noticed that choose your neighbor form letters are still a part of the situation. Furthermore, I learned from the Fagan article that thousands of current deeds have racially restricted covenants in them, embedded in the mound of paperwork that one has to sign in the process of hoping of, of buying or selling a house. One does not read every single line, especially when it seems to bear little significance. I would venture to say that even when it does bear significance, the signature is still made. When my mother left Churchill and made it to the north side of Richmond, her realtor was a black man. I often wondered where his clients, whether or not his clients were only blacks. I wonder also that if his clients were only blacks, did he steer them only to homes within the bounds of the black community or homes that were being so quickly abandoned that it was sold or at least one as at least one homeowner said 
that he was in the middle of remodeling, saw the blacks coming, dropped his hammer right there on the spot and told his family to pack up. They were leaving right away. It must have been a situation that was a, of a benefit to blacks who wanted to move into the neighborhood and had available to them a home that the owner was desperate to leave. I should add that when I, as a high school student, worked for that realtor, he assigned me the task of cleaning houses for $10 a day. And the houses were all, always in a black neighborhood. I wasn't yet old enough to get a work permit, so I was grateful for the job, as was my mother, who was able with his help to purchase a home. The white neighborhood became black, which prompts us to consider whether there are any benefits to segregation, particularly as pertains to such matters as home construction, home rehabilitation, house cleaning, businesses in general, employment in general, and effective education. The writer Zora Neale Hurston so much as said that she didn't feel like she had to live beside a white person or sit beside a white child in the classroom, feel that she was living well and being highly educated. Of course, she was labeled a reactionary, too conservative for voicing that perspective. Further on in the Realtor Code of Ethics, Article 10 reads, when involved in the sale or lease of a residence, realtors shall not volunteer information regarding the racial, religious, or ethnic uh, composition of any neighborhood, nor shall they engage in any activity which may result in panic selling. However, realtors may provide other democratic, demographic information. That section is rather ambiguous. It seems to suggest that a realtor cannot volunteer information on the racial composition of a neighborhood, but if a prospective buyer asks, then the floodgates have been opened and the realtor can talk about everything from current racial makeup to what the racial makeup the neighborhood had been throughout its history. In addition, I wonder what the framers of that clause had in mind when saying that information cannot be volunteered about racial, religious, or ethnic composition, but realtors may provide other demographic information. What other demographic information? Are there certain kinds of demographic information not mentioned in the clause that are nevertheless tantamount to saying what the racial code, what the racial makeup of the neighborhood is? where the prospective neighbors work, their position in that workplace, where they're from originally, their political affiliation, their extracurricular pursuits, just to name a few of the types of demographic, demographic information that the code presumably allows. There's that, that racial issue, <coughs> excuse me. But the housing issue in many cities across America has reached a crisis point. This past week, I was watching a CNN special entitled Shortage of Homes for Sale Sparks Bidding Wars. The focus was on certain areas in the New Jersey and Connecticut states. The commentator spoke of an influx of cash buyers willing to pay 25% over the asking price. The program gave an example of one buyer purchasing a home and then within a week selling it for $200,000 more than what he had originally paid. Added to that are the lumber and construction prices that have increased dramatically because production slowed down due to COVID and the demand now is extraordinarily high. In Burlington, Vermont, about an hour's drive from where I live, there exists, as one newspaper article put it, a modern day gilded age where the housing market has become something that favors, quote, people who have been tremendous who have tremendous disposable income that don't really have to think about these things, close quote. Even mobile homes in the city doubled in value, meaning an inordinate increase in property taxes. The article went on to explain that, quote, sales to non-Vermonters jumped 38% between 2019 and 2020, which only adds to the problem of limited supply of housing. As part of a solution, the city has proposed an inclusionary zoning policy and a housing trust to help with the buying, rehabbing, and reselling of affordable housing, whatever that affordable housing might mean. It strikes me as akin to slapping on a Band-Aid, hoping to heal a gaping wound. I want to draw your attention to adjacent communities in another part of Vermont, Stowe, the resort town, and Morrisville, the town that services Stowe. 
One town is full of outdoor cafes, specialty shops, elaborate bike paths, and ski equipment establishment. The other town is notable for its unemployment and homeless population. Until recently, the high school in that latter community was called the Poor People's Academy. When my daughter showed me a brochure with that name etched on it, I had to ask, are you kidding me? She replied, no, but they changed the name recently to the People's Academy. Can you imagine going to a high school called the Poor People's High School? The Poor People's High School Mighty Bulldogs. The Poor People's High School Scarlet Knights. It's sickening. And when you ask the students what they want to be, which I have done, they will tell you something along the lines of a cashier at the concession stand, or an orderly in Stowe, or a maid at the Stowe Hotel. And they seem to happy to have that as their life goal. I was watching a documentary about Appalachia, the mountains of Kentucky in particular. A large company had somehow gotten the rights to part of their mountain. And the purpose to which they put the land was to dump their contaminated waste. Too poor to wage a lengthy legal battle against a government supported company, they had to stand by and watch as their parents passed away in their mid fifties and their children got sick, things that had never occurred before. Two interviewees in particular, I remember, a woman who said she thought all they would have to do was pick it for two or three days, block the trucks from coming in and depositing the waste and it would all be over. She with the look of weariness in her eyes said that what she had learned instead was it goes on and on. The company convinced the court that the waste had nothing to do with the premature deaths and childhood illnesses. The dump was atop a mountain miles away from the residents. The contamination could not have drifted down in the manner that the residents declared. It goes on and on, the woman said, and we have to keep going on in spite of the obstacles for our children for our grandchildren. Another interview, he struck me as being quite profound. He said that there are some people who don't care about anything but themselves. They say, I won't be around 30 years from now. So what does it matter to me? The interviewee admitted to having been one of those types of people. But now he has been forced to ponder it more and has come to the conclusion that we have to think about how things be 50 years from now. How, if we last that long, things will be 200 years from now. It was fascinating to see that Appalachian community join with members of a nearby black community in the singing of, oh freedom, oh freedom, oh freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. Yeah. Before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my law and be free. The singing of oh, oh, freed, oh, freedom, as if they knew what it was like to have to fight an entity that had such power of life and death over them. They were very much like the residents of Flint, Michigan, with their contaminated drinking water. The only difference being that they could at least cling to their whiteness if they wished a valuable currency in this society. But the currency seemed to carry little weight when going up against the powers that be who cannot perceive in a poor person any level of humanity that is worthy of their concern. One of the ministers who was interviewed for our book about Vinegar Hill said that when schools or employers find out that they are from Hardy Drive, that is where the West Haven housing project to which residents of the hill were located is, they treat you as if you carry a stigma. You might not get the job because you live in a housing project. Teachers might treat you different from other students. Where you live means so much, not just in terms of the creature comforts, 
but in terms of how others perceive you, how you perceive yourself. With that thought in mind, I sought to find out how many black students from Charlottesville High School were admitted to the University of Virginia this year, last year, past few years, past decade. Finding out that information has been a difficult undertaking. I realize UVA is a world-class university now. People from around the world want to come here. If the stigma of Charlottesville black students still exists, I would urge that everything possible be done to remove that stigma. A large part of the responsibility rests in the students themselves. But if the People's Academy of Morrisville can serve as any kind of warning, those students will need help along the lines of what my wife and I benefited from during the era when UVA programs such as Upward Bound and Transition were flourishing entities. I applaud Piedmont Virginia Community College uh, for its network to program work. Connecting job seekers with potential employers, providing employment and life coaching, providing transportation, interceding on behalf of the worker when the job seemed, seemed threatened, understanding Charlottesville's history. <clears throat> but I could not help but notice, notice the fields in which employment is sought, healthcare, manufacturing, childcare, public safety, and programs where apprenticeships are needed. It is interesting that 56% of the job seekers were African-American, vastly disproportionate to whites. Why is that? Towns like Burlington with its own renowned university or Stowe or Charlottesville will always need a support system. And I do mean system. People need jobs, especially those who are most vulnerable. But where are the management training programs, the paralegal programs, the programs geared to help students rise to the next educational level, which in my mind means UVA or another comparable institution. Without those, I am inclined, inclined to wonder if the city is not much different than how I perceived it when I stepped off the Trailways bus to begin my freshman year and felt deep down in my bones that I had been transported back in time. As if I, as if I were part of a Twilight Zone episode, excuse me. <coughs> Watching the 1960s being turned into the 1940s and my only escape was to get on the bus and head back home. I must confess that I was surprised when I got this invitation to speak before you. Pleasantly surprised, but surprised. Aren't realtors the status quo? Don't you all at least perpetuate the status quo? Isn't the main concern how large a commission I can get? Then I remember but that it was a realtor who gave me my first summer job. Not, not bad for a 14-year-old black boy whose previous employment was $2 a pop mowing lawns. More recently, when I was purchasing my own first home, I had the benefit of a realtor who not only gave me an education in the real estate field, she guided my wife and me through the home building process, warned us of snares, and was a constant presence in spite of the home builder doing everything in his power to schedule appointments with us when he thought she would be unavailable. I could go on. The troubles we had with the inspector, the troubles we had with some of the subcontractors, she was there, seeming to want more than just the commission. She knew what we were up against, herself being a fatherless poor girl from West Virginia. She said she didn't want us to have to go through what her mother had gone through trying to navigate the housing related uh, situation with predators who are out there. So I should have known about the power that exists in a realtor's hands and never have questioned why I was invited here. Realtors care about the society in which they live. Many want to correct the injustices. What can realtors do? I believe that in many ways, a realtor's hands are fixed, tied, particularly since they supposedly operate in the best interests of their clients. Sometimes there's a thin line between ethical conduct and what is in the best interest of your client. Sometimes the line is so blurred, it seems not to even be there. Having read the Charlottesville Plans Together plan and that city's affordable housing plan, I would urge you, if you have not already done so, to do so. It is comprehensive and apparently well-meaning. In fact, 
One of the members of today's panel is significantly involved, particularly regarding evaluating feedback about the plan. I would urge you to provide that feedback, both positive and negative. After all, you know the lay of the land better than anyone, especially when you think of yourselves as an aggregate entity. One person can do a lot, but there is strength in numbers. Organizations such as what are present today can lend a united front as the process for change ensues. Please keep in mind that there will never be agreement about everything. But when your organizations are called upon to account, you should speak with that united voice, which means you cannot ignore members who have opposing views. You have to not only listen, but embrace what should be every American citizen's right to disagree without fear of resentment <clears throat> or reprisal or violence. A good airing out of all views will make the United Front that much stronger. When I look at the Charlottesville Plans Together proposal, several things come to mind. One of the goals is to quote, support a range of housing types in all neighborhoods. That is stated rather broadly, but it reminds me of a time back in the 70s when Yonkers officials proposed the public housing project. Many citizens were up in arms. Many of them had to move, had moved to Yonkers to get away from what they considered to be the detriments of living in New York City. To be blunt, they had moved to get away from Blacks. When the 60 Minutes commentator asked one white resident if it was racist to want to not live with Blacks, his response was that he wasn't against Blacks. If Sammy Davis Jr. or Diana Ross wanted to move into his community, they would be welcomed. He wasn't against Blacks moving in. There are neighborhoods in Charlottesville where the goal is to live apart from the general Black population. So it will be interesting to see how that part of the Charlottesville Plans Together goal will be implemented. I imagine there will be some resistance to having a range, whatever that means, of housing types in all neighborhoods. Point two, the city is to commit $10 million annually over 10 years, but with 2,000 low-end homes in danger of rent going up astronomically and another 1,000 residents living in public housing, how will that $10 million go? And here I will defer to my wife, who grew up in Charlottesville government subsidized housing, who in discussing the plan with me asked, who will get first access to such funds? In the past, it has been whites who have gotten first access and what was left over went to the blacks. Her parents owned a business on Vinegar Hill. Moreover, she watched the government take over her parents' farm through the process of eminent domain, expensive condominiums, where few if any Blacks live now exist where the farm once was. She watched as one Black male member of her family after another devolved into chronic alcoholism for want of opportunity to be something other than a menial laborer. Down to World War II veterans collecting cans for extra income and grown men just one generation before her having to always bow and say, sir, when talking to any white man. White women were off limits under threat of losing your life. Who will such funds go to first? As we further discuss the plan and its desire to increase the production of multifamily housing, I asked my wife, does that mean apartments? She said, yes, that's what that means. But will there be something more than five to 600 square feet? Will there be high rises in some isolated section of town? Will their walls be paper thin where you can hear their neighbors talking and the commode flushing? Will it be arranged so that elderly residents will be located on the first floor with access to a hospital and necessary stores? Will they have a washer and dryer? A logical question for my wife, who was substantially raised by a washerwoman grandmother, who served as something of a boarding house mother as well, for relatives, 25 and all, who worked as country club caddies, personal maids, loggers, cooks, and every other menial position that was available to Blacks in the Charlottesville period of the 1940s and 50s. She took in a white man too, one who had been outcast from the white community because he had a hole in his throat. And when he talked, his words were hardly discernible. Charlottesville's plan will supposedly support and protect existing communities, particularly those most at risk of displacement. This might prove to be quite a chore considering that there are powerful entities in Charlottesville 
who are interested in getting access to the West Haven housing project in order to provide housing for UVA students. Though I've been told it will never happen, I have heard rumors that there are those who would love to gain access to the government subsidized complex on Prospect Avenue for a similar purpose. One ever senses a tenuousness associated with living in that neighborhood, one that has existed on our side of the tracks for decades, a side of the tracks once isolated, but now quite attractive as the expansion of the university has situated the Black Housing Project dead center in the university's backyard. As I understand it, the university plans together proposal provides a land use vision, but it does not provide details related to implement implementation of the vision. And as the proposal states, it needs to be paired with other policies and funding for affordable options. There's a lot of wiggle room in that statement. So I must defer to one of my fellow members of the Vermont Board of Libraries who I asked to uh, ask for advice regarding the affordable housing issue in Burlington. Like my wife, he is not a one to pussyfoot around the issues. What he told me, is that it has been an issue for five decades. There's going to be a summit about it this summer. How to provide affordable housing, or should I say another summit. There's been a large swath of land and left empty in the middle of Burlington, presumably for affordable housing. Meanwhile, actual affordable homes that were once deemed on the outskirts of the city are now adjacent to the international airport. They are being confiscated for airport purposes. I think you can see what I'm getting at. They are trying to provide affordable homes at the same time they are confiscating affordable homes. Something akin to giving with one hand and taking away with the other, if there is any giving at all. One of the political leaders of the city is an expert developer, nicknamed by some the developer in chief. That's how good he is. But affordable housing is somehow not within his area of expertise, evidently. One of our unit U.S. senators has a, a relative who benefits directly from the airport's expansion to include a highly touted military installation. Thus the need for the confiscation of those affordable homes within direct range of that expansion. What I am contending is that despite all our good intentions, there is still that element in us that confirms what a character in Robert Penn Warren's novel, All the King's Men, once said. Man was born into sin and corruption, from the dildo to the shroud. That should not be ignored. I can recall the year when for the first time in Richmond, Blacks made up the majority of city council. And then soon after that achievement, a cascade of corrupt activities was exposed, including commingling of funds and their awarding of construction contracts to family members and friends under threat of imprisonment, some of the council members simply resigned. There goes that representation. When I, when I read in Charlottesville's plan about how there will be community representation in decision-making, prioritization of the use of funds and minimizing potential barriers to access, I was reluctant to accept it at face value. The plan further states that it will, quote, build inclusive governance at all levels. What does the plan mean when it says community? Will Blacks really be given a substantial voice? That is not what happened with Vinegar Hill or Garrett Square or a host of other eminent domain and land acquisition projects. And even when Blacks have been given a voice, some, have, some of them have been, shall I say, less than effective. Some just so happy to have been given a title and a little bit of authority that they would sell their own mother down the river, let alone what they would do to the black community under the auspices of helping them. Having said that, I must emphasize that the community, the Charlottesville Plans Together proposal is extraordinary. Down payment assistance, property tax relief, rezoning to allow for soft, soft density in single family neighborhoods, funding transparent, transparency, and much more. All great things. But I still can't help but remember the old adages that my forebears plied me with. Seeing is believing. The proof is in the pudding. A bird in the hand is worth two over there in the bush. Talk is cheap. 
Tomorrow is not promised. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. We open with a prayer, so I will end with one. And because it is appropriate. God, we thank you for this gathering, the sharing of ideas. Grant us the perseverance that others before us exhibited as they were engaged in their own struggle for equality and justice and a life filled with meaning and moral satisfaction. Thank you. Dr. Saunders, thank you. This continues to be a raw and emotional topic and we truly appreciate your participation and look forward to continuing to work with you. To assist me in Q&A with Dr. Saunders, I would like to introduce Leslie Frazier, Senior Vice President of Community and Ind in Industry Relations of Virginia, of, of Virginia Realtors. Leslie. Hi everyone, good morning. Thank you so much, yes, Lisa. Um, as was mentioned, I am Leslie Frazier. I'm the Senior Vice President of Community and Industry Relations at Virginia Realtors. Dr. Saunders, thank you so much for that session today. It's been a pleasure just hearing you speak and learning from you. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that I was on mute and that my camera was off because when you started singing the Negro Spiritual O Freedom, I was clapping and singing with you, but not well, <laughs> I may add. <laughs> Um, so my role at Virginia Realtors is a brand new position to the association, and I think a lot of organizations have looked internally over the past year and some change with the pandemic and have really asked, you know, are we diverse? Are we inclusive? Are we representing the populations we serve? So my position was created to really build a lot of industry relations with partners like Virginia Housing, for example, but I'm primarily lead our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. So it has been a pleasure to just join this world of real estate and, and see the changes that are being made, you know, the attempts to right wrongs of the past and just be a part of it. Um, I, I wanna thank Virginia Housing for being a sponsor today. I've had an opportunity to work with a lot of the folks there, but I've also been on the customer side. I purchased my house with their down payment assistance grant. And um, I live in the Churchill neighborhood of Richmond, which Dr. Saunders mentioned his mom lived there. Um, and my neighborhood was certainly redlined back in the day, but I, I wouldn't be sitting where I am today, quite literally, as I'm in my house, if it hadn't been for Virginia Housing. So glad that they're a partner. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure to work both with the Charlottesville Area Association of Realtors and the Richmond chapter of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, and I am a member of NAREB. So I'm so glad that Petrina shared the video earlier of NAREB's origins. You know, I knew about a lot of the discriminatory housing policy and practices from back in the day that still have a lot of impacts today. But, you know, by being an actual member of NAREB, I've learned so much. And, you know, and as a Black woman, it's been great to connect with an organization that's so dedicated to democracy and housing and increasing Black home ownership. So I am a proud realtist. And, um, you know, I think I've worked with CAR more than any other local association since I've joined Virginia Realtors, which is a testament to how much the association's doing in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. But Charlottesville has had a special place in my heart for a while now. I went to UVA, so I lived in the area for four years, and I'm so happy that this event is being put on. My apartment in college was very close to the Vinegar Hill neighborhood, so it's just great to see NAREB and Charlottesville and just all of these partners come together today. So thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'll shut up now because I know we've got about 20 minutes of questions and I'm sure the group is anxious to ask Dr. Saunders a lot. So I'll kick it back over to S. Lisa and we'll start the Q&A. Okay, let's dive into the questions. Thank you, Leslie, for being with us today. Dr. Saunders, can you share a little about the process and resources used to gather information for your book, Urban Renewal and the End of Black Culture in Charlottesville, Virginia? I, I absolutely can. It was about the same time that my wife and I, who I'd known for several years before we actually got married, but we did get together and we worked on some of the courses at University of Virginia that would provide some background for the the history not only of the United States, but the history of Charlottesville in particular. And together we came up with a plan on how to teach uh, those courses and were able to garner students from those courses actually, who went out and did a lot of the interviewing uh, of, of individuals I would imagine 
who are all, have all, most for the most part anyway, I would say 95% of them have passed away. So the, act, the acquiring of those interviews was also very important. Interestingly enough, there was a retirement program that the city had, and there was a woman there named Ruth Eggleton who had asked certain individuals at the university, were they interested in the history of, uh, of Vinegar Hill? And my, my wife and myself were the only two that said we were willing to sort of work with Ms. Eggleton. Uh, my wife is the one who organized all of the interviews, uh, did a lot of the research, and I did a lot of the research. And we actually came together and did a lot of arguing, her being from Charlottesville, me being from Richmond, and coming from two different perspectives. Uh, I would imagine, as I think back on it, every other page involved an argument. Uh, and it took many years, as a matter of fact, for us to resolve those arguments, how we should say certain things, who we should be appreciative for, who, should, who we should be critical of, uh, whose perspectives. And it just so happened that um, uh, Mr. Raymond Bell, who has passed away at this particular point, he gave a lot of information. Uh, Mr. George Ferguson, who was a, a doctor's son and uh, an undertaker himself, provide with a lot of information. But also the individual people who worked as maids or cooks, uh, teachers, they provided a lot of information. Uh, it was a very time consuming process, one that involved a, a tremendous amount, as I said, of discussion. And, and uh, at, one, at times that we, we even wondered whether or not we were gonna stay together, we were so vehement in our perspectives. Uh, and many times I had to defer to her because she is from Charlottesville. But so that's, that's how the book got actually going. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. Um, I'll ask the next question and I'll summarize it a little bit, but um, the question from the audience is really around, you know, there have been laws that have been passed to, to promote change, but it still requires better awareness and recognition of issues, especially amongst those who are influential. So um, the individual has talked to people who've worked against or, or studied and educated the public about changes in systemic racism. And, and those folks are hopeful about the conversations taking place, but do you feel like there is progress happening? You know, you know what I'm supposed to say, that we have uh, come a long way, we gotta come, we've got a long way to go. And I've heard that so many times, I, didn't, I don't even know what that means anymore. But of course there's been progress. Uh, there were times when, if a black person even walked in a, neighborhood. Richard Wright has written stories about this. Uh, there's a possibility he might get killed and then any, any kind of con excuse contrived as to why he was actually killed. Uh, things were so bad that the way I was raised was don't trust any white person. Uh, now I've come to learn, of course, that you know, there are some whites that you can trust. Uh, I've, I've, I've come to believe that, as I'm sure many of the civil rights workers have come to understand, that you really can't do it alone. You really do need a, a, a large cohort of disparate and diverse individuals in order to actually overcome change. It can't be one group of people on one side and another group of people on the other just fighting. I think there's a Star Trek episode that they go through centuries. There's, a, there's, there's a, one person who's half white and half black and another person who's half white and half black. The white and black is on their faces are, are on different sides depending on the individual. And they just go through the centuries out there in outer space fighting each other. If it, if it evolved, if that's what it is, I, I wouldn't think that very much progress at all has been made. I tend also to have, I mean, all my faith rests in God. So I recall how the Jews got out of Egypt. I recall how Daniel got out of the lion's den. I recall how someone, Jesus, could actually go through his, his life wanting to do nothing other than good and be killed for it. And, and yet still we, we exist. I recall my forebears, uh, my grandparents who I grew up with to a large extent, born in the 1870s, who did I, it was, it must've been so bad that they didn't even talk about it. It was never, race was not even mentioned. We just kept to ourselves, stayed out of the way of whites and hoped for the best to get some kind of fulfillment out of life. I think that has changed to a large extent. I would not have been able to go to the University of Virginia if there hadn't been people white and black because there was a president that I think was actually sneaking them in before he was publicizing it. Uh, so it actually started before Blacks started really protesting strongly against it. It started with whites saying something's wrong. So I think that there are, there's a morality that exists out there in some people. I've come to the conclusion that I'd, I'd hate to say this, but there are people who have no conscience. They could just assume kill a person and step on a bug. There are other people out there who would sacrifice their lives 
for a certain kind of morality. And there are some people out there who, if they made a promise to somebody, they would try to keep that promise if you kill them in order to, to keep that promise. So th there, there's, I got to believe that there's a certain kind of progress. And I got to believe also that as we make our way to a, a life, this is a very short life, as we make our way to something in another realm and, and, and we're being sort of assessed as we go through this particular realm, that, that a, a lot depends on how we behave in this realm and that there is something better than, than just this earth. Uh, so that, that keeps me going. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask a question um, going back to the book. Um, did you and Dr. Shackelford receive any resistance while uncovering what really happened to African-American community of Vinegar Hill? Well, upon interviewing uh, Mr. Gene Arrington, who was the head of the Charles Hill Redevelopment and, and Housing Authority at the time, Thank goodness he was, was still there when we came along. Uh, and he had been someone who had implemented a lot of the, the, the Vinegar Hill program. I think, and he knew that we were going to do something. So, of, of course, he wanted to put things in as favorable a light as he possibly could. You get such a diversity of opinion. When it came to Blacks, there were some Blacks who said it needed to be gotten rid of Vinegar Hill. Some of the houses were very dilapidated. Others said no, it was a community. There were lots of businesses. Some whites say, yes, Blacks should have been given a voice. Other whites say, no, that community had chickens. It was, it was like a, I don't know what you want to call it, but a, a, a poverty-stricken, in some respects, farm community right in the midst of Charlottesville. Uh, and so that there were some whites who explained that we just needed to get rid of that. And that, that would help them. That would help the Blacks. Uh, not even really mentioning how much it was going to help the city of Charlottesville and the University of Virginia decades and decades down the road, which I tend to believe was, was on the minds of a lot of people. I really do believe that on the minds of a lot of whites was let's get these blacks. I mean, at one time in Charlottesville was a little country town. Okay, you could have your blacks in a little pocket there, downtown. But as, it, as things progressed at the university and moved from being a regional university to being a world-class university, things changed. You could almost say that there must be some who think that the city of Charlottesville should be part of the University of Virginia campus. So again, you get a, a, wide, uh, a, a wide variety of opinions about that. Yeah, thank you. So, so Dr. Saunders, the next question is, you know, engagement continues to be a challenge to gain input for comprehensive plans, et cetera. How do you suggest the Charlottesville City Council or steering committee ask for feedback from Charlottesville residents? You know, obviously these types of plans impact them the most. Sure. I, th I think that, and it's hard to do sometimes because it gets kind of dangerous, I think, on some occasions. But you have to go where people live. You, you, you can't really sit in an office or even stand on a street corner and, or even write something up in a document and say, this is what we want to do. What do you think of it? I think it's important to get the input. There are individuals out there now who are better equipped. My mother-in-law is one example, just one example, who are better equipped to give you very valuable perspectives on, on what would be good to do. They've lived it. They've come from the backwoods of areas around Charlottesville, come into Charlottesville at a in the 1940s and 50s, I'll, I'll just say that. They know how things have happened since about the 1930s. and 1940s, how should I say, personally, uh, to now we get to this point where in 2021, there'll be some valuable input they would get. I, I think also that though that some, they've seen enough black city council people. They've seen enough black administrators. They've seen enough black police chiefs. chiefs. They've seen enough black mayors. They've seen enough black superintendents of schools. They've seen enough black so-called leaders that they really, to some extent, don't have that much faith in. I mentioned the situation in Richmond, for example. Human nature. <clears throat> if you're looking for, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're looking for someone to build a building, to look at your building construct constructing brother first before you start spreading the opportunities around or let that person know what the lowest bid is so you can go even lower, those kind of things go on. Blacks who have seen something like Vinegar Hill destroyed, many of them are not going to have a whole lot of trust in whites and their black underlings. So, so it's going to be very important, I think, sincerity, if you, is there we can get that across, is something that's very important, important. If blacks still go to church, go to the church. 
Go to the high school where 45% of the black students go, which is Charlottesville High School. Find out what's going on there. Know who their parents are. Know what their situations are. Know what the jobs are that they can get. Learn what the harbingers of racism from decades and decades ago are still here in existence. <clears throat> And again, I, I have to bring up this issue too because wealth and power mean a lot. So somehow or another, those who have all this wealth and power and university affiliation somehow have to be brought into the conversation too, not just in terms of fulfilling some kind of project that they might have, but on a sincere level. And if it turns out, I can recall when I was a student at the University of Virginia and we were trying, there were only about two or three black faculty members. So we wanted to sit in we had to help sit-ins and protests to try to get some kind of improvement. And we had to we had to very quickly learn that there are really some people you cannot trust. It's it's a it's it's a it's an ability that the old slaves and, and the immediate their immediate press, I said I say uh, the subsequent children, I think they mastered. They had to know the difference between a good person and a white and a, and a, and a bad white person. They had to know who, even if if, if something is being done that's for their own benefit, who, for a little bit of money, sort of like Judas, will sell their soul? And, and you have to figure out who those individuals are. And I hate to say this, but not really pay too much attention to them and just hope that they don't interfere too much in terms of whatever their, their interests actually might be. And I don't think we can fool ourselves into believing that there will, there will always be a Judas uh, who will say anything that they're told to say. And, 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 and at the same time, you have to try to figure out how do you get progress? How do you really help people uh, who are going through hell and, and, and knowing that there are some people who have no idea of what a conscience even is? So it's, it's, it can be really very complicated. I think it's a struggle, uh, like those uh, uh, um, Kentucky uh, Appalachian individuals. They, they learn it's a struggle. It goes on and on. You can't expect, okay, that we'll, we'll solve this. There will be those who maybe if, if, so, if a solution was uh, found and implemented, that there would be a devilish person somewhere lingering in the mountains waiting for you to come through the pass so that they can cut your head off. I, th I think that you have to always be kind of aware of those kinds of things too and not, not be too naive that, that, that evil does exist, that bad people do exist, that people pretending to have your best interests at heart who could care less about anybody but themselves, as another individual said, are there. Uh, but meanwhile, it's also important to keep in mind that there are lots of good people. I think someone said uh, uh, that uh, even worse than a bad person is a good person who just stands by and do, does nothing. So I would say that we would not want to be those good people who stand by and do nothing. Uh, and, and I think that'll go a long way, too. Yeah, I love that. I completely agree with that. Um, we have another question. As a longtime Charlottesville area realtor, I have often felt the absence of African-American realtors in this area. Would you please speak to that? Speak to the absence of black realtors <laughs> in Charlottesville? Could I at the same time speak to the uh, not substantial number of black bank managers in Charlottesville and not the su uh, a, a substantial number of black businesses on the pedestrian mall and not other than for this rush for diversity, not an awful lot of uh, black administrators at, administrators at the University of Virginia. How many black principals are there at the various schools in the area? How many black, uh, all kinds of prominent positions, how many of them are black? And how many of them were given the job because the, the intent was for them to be a lackey? I, I, uh, I, I would think that it's just been a struggle in the area. And, and for a black realtor, I don't know, to get white clients, on a, on, a, on a par with what a white realtor can get in terms of white clients. I think it's, a, I would think it's an uphill struggle for a black realtor to have black clients. You, I think you've also got the struggle of them wondering, are you to be trusted? Or are you just someone who's gonna perpetuate the, the uh, residential system as is? It's, 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 it's gonna be hard, but, but it's worth the struggle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I would like to ask, um, in regards to the moral and social effects of public housing, going back to the public housing issue, you know, 
it continues to have generational trauma and generational effects on our communities. What are some of your insights in how we can deal with that and how we can address some of those traumas with the families that, you know, continue to have to live in those public housing um, environments? It's, it's been too long. I mean, when, when, when in the 1940s and 50s, these projects got started, Black individuals, they had, a, they had apartments. Blacks were different then. Black men didn't kill each other for looking at them the wrong way. Black women could walk around at, at nighttime without fear of being raped. Black families supported each other. Blacks believed in a spiritual side to themselves as opposed to just a, how can I satisfy me physically immediately? And that'd be it. We, we were a different people. Uh, so I wanted to mention that too, when you talk about morality and the social aspects of it. When we moved into these apartment complexes, they didn't start off with gang wars and dilapidated uh, roofs and, and all kinds of other dilapidation. They, they started off as nice quaint apartments that blacks could live in and could afford, like any other apartment complex. I think the, 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 there came a stigma associated to it. And I, I look at Cabrini Green in Chicago, for example, uh, and, and how it turned into something that was positive into something that was negative. I think, I think even though we had those apartments, we still were thought of as being at the bottom of society. And, and society has a way, because I'm not going to put all the blame on the residents of those complexes, even as they're killing themselves. I, I, I put some of the blame on us as human beings feeling the need to feel like we're better than other people. There seems this, to be this prevailing need that individuals have. My skin is lighter. My hair is straighter. I live in a better neighborhood. I make more money than you. I go to the university. Where do you go? My children are this. Your children are that. How do they compare to your children? My children got better grades than your children got. Uh, we are evidently intent on feeling like we're better than us. I got better shoes than you got. My dress is better than yours. My suit is better than yours. My car is better than yours. My, my, I mean, it just goes on and on. I don't know how you eliminate that. So then you look at somebody at a, in a housing project, even the teachers who claim to want to help, I, they got to, to some extent, say, I know who your father was. I know that he was a, a, lived in the same housing project and didn't really do too much with his life. He's not, he's not like the teacher over here whose child I probably will pay more attention to. I, I place some of the blame in ourselves that, oh, well, you know, I'm not really going to go out and do too much because I really don't have time or I really don't have the resources or I'm not going to make too much change anyway. I think that children who grew up under those circumstances feel it. They feel that they have been put in a position in society that they're going to be disregarded or treated badly to the point where they now have come to expect it. It's not the same black family that moved into the project in, 1940, in the 1940s. Now we've got the 1980s and 90s and on into the 21st century and it goes on and on. It's the same story. It's the, those who have uh, and, and on one side and those who have have not on the other side. How do we all get along, to borrow an expression? I, I, uh, I think one of the things that I was told early on that the foundations are the church, the family, and the school. So if those three things are all working well, then the child has got a chance. If those things are not working well, then something has to be done to remedy those things not working well, and that will give the, the, the child a chance. I, I, when it comes to something like morality, it's not for me to go to God is going to judge that. We can walk around saying all kinds of good things, but he knows, and, and that judgment will come later. But meanwhile, I think that we should not, I think we should avoid judging those kind of individuals. If, if there's some way to get across that a poor child is just as important as a rich child, if that message can be gotten across, then I think that there's hope for social advancement and, and, and moral advancement too. Thank you, Dr. Saunders. We have time for two more questions, so I'll go ahead and ask them for you now. Or to you now, the first is, you know, in your opinion, how can the Charlottesville Association or really any uh, real estate association encourage more diversity for people interested in real estate? You know, starting off can be expensive with education and certification, and I know NAREP is partnering to help more diverse members enter the profession, but curious your thoughts on how we can diversify more. I would think, you know, that it can't be done overnight, and maybe not even within just a few years, but a good place to begin would be 
the, the schools, the elementary schools, mm. and not just the schools that are thought of as the, the, the place where there's an awful lot of uh, potential for advancement in society, but the places where there's not thought to be an awful lot of potential for advancement. You got, I've gone back to my old high school and it's become a black sort of, uh, how should I put this, poverty stricken high school even, even this is in terms of the resources that the city and state will, will allow it. And it was very difficult getting high school students to want to apply to college. I think they have been so burdened down with the, the obstacles that their own grandparents and parents have mm -hmm. had to face that, and a lot of times, because we as a society don't think the way we do anymore, some of them, you can have three or four children in one family, all of them with different last names, uh, to the point where I'm even confused as to what happened. And they've got to live that. And I, I don't know how you get them, someone like that, to, to be encouraged to go into real estate. I wonder, do they even know what that is? I, I, uh, I mean, what, what, what does that mean? What's involved? What, what are the possibilities? Uh, they say as far as Vinegar Hill is concerned, once those black businesses were destroyed, for a lot of children, it meant they would never have seen a grocery store owner, would never have seen a haberdashery owner or uh, any other kind of business owner. And they, they had nothing uh, to, to go by except the remnants of, of their past. I would urge starting as young as possible. Tiger Woods started golf, I think, at about three. Venus and Serena Williams, I think, remember about the same age. Sammy Davis Jr., about three. That's how how they got so great. There was Mickey Mantle's father, I think, threw the baseball glove into the crib with him before he could hardly even open his eyes. And I mean, I think it's starting off very, very, very young is, is, is uh, very important. By the time they reach high school, it might be, it might be a little late. No, I love that. And, and related to youth, you know, I've got to ask the last question. So um, I am, I'm a millennial. And oftentimes I am the youngest or one of the youngest people in the spaces that I'm in. So what advice do you have for, for my generation and the one coming behind me really entering the profession on, on keeping up the fight? I, you know, I've, I've really thought about that an, an awful lot. And I'm, I have limited experience in terms of interacting with real tours or real tests. And, and uh, I said to myself, I can talk about these plans and where I think they're positive and where I think they might be flawed. And I don't even know where that, how far that's gonna, what that's gonna even mean. But, but uh, in ter terms of realtors and realtors, I said to myself, what advice can you give but that they speak with a united front? I would think, I look at the back of my cover of the University of Virginia Magazine and I see some of those homes being sold and I'm assuming it's gonna be a white realtor. And I say to myself, wow, all they have to do is sell one house every two years. And, and they've got, <laughs> they'll be doing just great in terms of, of, of their own potential uh, finance. I mean, how do I, what do I say to a group that has another realtor who can't even get a client and, 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 and say they should work together and present a united front for this plan to provide affordable housing? I, I got to confess, I don't know. I, I, uh, but I do think that it is important to, to try to work together. I do think that there are lots of white realtors who, who know what's in, in another situation. They know that there are lots of areas around Charlottesville that they can advertise and, and, and what the client is expecting is a white realtor. Uh, they know that. Uh, I, I have this image in my, my mind and it may be a, uh, uh, an inappropriate image, but I have my, an image in my mind of a young, a youngish, I won't say really young, but a youngish white blonde woman uh, going around to the different houses trying to sell them. Sort of like uh, a lot of other, everything else that's sold in America, your car, your shaving cream, the construction uh, equipment, the, uh, it just everything. Stick a white woman in there who's sort of youngish and you got a chance of selling it. A anything else, I'm not too sure what the, what the chances are. So how many of those white women are interested in making sure that poor blacks in Charlottesville had access to to affordable housing. I, I really do not know how you get that, that organization. I will say though, however, when we were protesting at the University of Virginia, they just, they just saw the situation is so bad that many of them thought it, 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 it impinged upon them to try to do something to help. And I, I think that when someone sees that the situation is at, at the crisis level and if they do nothing, that it actually could come, come back to bite them. Uh, the, if we ignore, for example, 
a lot of the issues that we have today, we're not going to be able to go to the suburbs and and uh, and be free and safe. Uh, so if you got a, a large segment of the population, and I think as far as I've the documents that I read, about 33% of Charlottesville citizens cannot self-sustain themselves. I don't know how you felt about it, but it was frightening to me. If, you, if you're gonna approach half of the citizenry not able to even feed themselves, I think the way Tupac Shakur put it was that, that um, and here I am on the outside of this fancy hotel, the people up inside the hotel, they're eating well, throwing food, wasting it. I'm outside saying, can I have some? Uh, they said, oh, we don't have anything left. Tupac Shakur says, uh, oh, okay, go back, come back another time. The party is still going on. Can, can you share some? Can I have some? Is, and they said, oh, no, go, get away. We, we don't want anything to do with you. We don't have enough. Uh, okay, Tupac Shakur said, okay, so we go back. We come back the third time. You think we're going to ask? And, and, and that's, just, that's, that, that's sort of how I see the situation now. If it gets to the point where so many people are disenfranchised for so long, it's going to lead to a certain type of violence. And I think that all realtors are, and should be aware of that potential. You cannot live in a society. And, and I, I, I think William Faulkner, who was a, a resident scholar at the uh, University of Virginia, said, you cannot live in a society where so many people are disenfranchised and expect the society to be safe. So I think that, that that's one basis for kind of some kind of unification. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> But I do feel that if somehow you all were to get great organization with a great leader, and I'm sorry to mention that usually the great leaders get killed. I, I, I can't ignore that as well. Just mm -hmm. You really do have to, at a certain point, say, well, you know, somebody might hit me or somebody might throw something at me. So somebody might shoot me. And, and, and uh, I think if, if there is a leader like that around, and the people will know that type of leader. The, the shuffling leaders, they don't, they know too, but they also know the leaders that are willing to sacrifice. And, and I think that would be another good foundation for organization. Thank you so much. I'll kick it back over to Aslisa. Okay. Thank you for that. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for question and answers. Dr. Saunders, may we send you the remaining questions from today's session to answer by email? Absolutely. Thank you again for being with us this morning. We greatly appreciate your time. And thank all of you your all. I, just to, I hate to interrupt you, but I want to thank all of you all too, because it really is an honor to be able to share my thoughts with you all. I appreciate it. You're very welcome and you're welcome back anytime. Your thought provoking observations and questions have made us um, be better individuals collectively as well. We look forward to continuing these conversations with you, Doctor, and Dr. Shackerford soon. This will be um, done in our upcoming events. Petrina, did you have any other comments you'd like to make? Yes, just real quick. I would like to um, respond to one of the things in the chat about the African-American realtors. Unfortunately, it's not just Charlottesville. Um, there's a lack in all areas. And one of the things that NARAB is currently doing, I tried to put it in the chat, was that we are sponsoring a 5,000, or giving a $5,000 scholarship. We're partnering with Homelight to encourage more African American realtors to apply. The $5,000 would cover their classes, their first year dues for NAR and NARAB. And also it would set them up with a mentor for a year. So I think that's a great um, program that NARAB is having, and hopefully we can encourage more African American realtors to, well, African American people to apply to become realtors and realtors. And then also real quick, I just wanted to mention that the Realtors Chapter of Richmond has two events coming up, and I will send Ali the information. Um, one of them, we have a sponsorship and partnership with Virginia Housing. They're currently doing some webinars for us. And for, as you know, June is Home Ownership Month. So we have a home ownership, um, the, the process and pathway to success event coming up at the end of the month. And our very own Pamela Westbrook, who did our prayer earlier, was the chairperson for that, and, or is the chairperson for that. So I'll send out the information for that event. We will have, we have um, a title company, 
um, a loan officer, someone speaking about down payment assistance. I think it's going to be a great program. So we invite anybody that would like to attend that to attend. And again, I'll send out the information. And then also real quick, we're having another program this month. Um, and that will be on the VITA program, which I had just recently heard about, which um, eligible participants can get training and support and matching funds. So that program will provide each participant who saves a dollar, they will match $8 up to $4,000. So they can um, save for a down payment for a house. So I think that's a great program that I just recently learned about. So our chapter has some interesting and informative things coming up this month. So hopefully some of you can attend. And that program is being provided by the, excuse me, the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. And I'll send that information out. And again, I would just like to thank CAR for inviting us to participate with them today. And we look forward to the events coming up in the fall. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that information. Before we end today's session, I want to say thank you to those members who donated to the Habitat for Humanities of Greater Charlottesville and the Richmond Metropolitan Habitat for Humanities. We will be reaching out to each of those organi organizations to see how much money we've raised during this session, and we'll share the totals um, next week. We hope that you will join us for our next virtual diversity and inclusion session, which is going to be on Thursday, August the 12th at 10 a.m. Leslie Frazier will present how to have difficult conversations around race or anything different for that matter. Registration is free and open to both CAR and NARAB Realist um, chapter of Richmond members. The registration link can be found on the flyer in your handout. Again, we thank you for joining us and we hope that you have a great day.